So thank you to everybody who joined us on if you are in Philly or the rather close surrounding areas on this rainy Tuesday night. My name is Alexis. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Seaport Museum. Um, and we are hosting this panel to talk about sharing the Delaware and how that's definitely been a big topic of conversation. Um, more so now just with a lot more recreation happening on the Delaware um, and obviously the commercial hub that we get as well. Um, so thank you all again for attending. Um, as we're talking, please feel free. It's a, a free flowing conversation to enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A portion will be at the end of the hour that we spend together. Um, so what we're gonna do right now is kind of go around, we're gonna have the panelists introduce themselves and kind of give a little bit uh, information about what they do and how their job relates to the Delaware um, as it pertains to this conversation. So first we have Liz Dupree from Aqua Vita. Hi guys. Uh, so yeah, my name is Liz Dupree and I'm the floating studio owner of Aqua Vita. And every summer we run floating fitness classes and stand up paddleboard tours in the marina at Spruce Street Harbor Park on the Delaware. So we spend a lot of time, a lot of people end up in the water because <laughs> yoga on a paddleboard is as hard as it sounds. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's what we do in the Delaware. And next um, we have Charlie McCammon from Patriot Harbor Lines. Mm -hmm. Always muted. Yeah, Charlie, we're having difficulty hearing you. Nope. Okay, we'll come back to Charlie. Uh, let's go to Todd Pride, who is the lead coach for the Mid-Atlantic Youth Anglers and Outdoors Partners Organization. Yeah, so uh, thanks Alexis. I know in the um, marketing information, it referenced the, uh, the Land Conservancy for Southern Chester County. Uh, so actually for the previous um, almost a year and a half, uh, I've been um, stepped in to manage that organization, which was a partner organization for uh, the Mid-Atlantic Youth Anglers organization. So I'll reference from Mid-Atlantic going forward. Um, things have uh, become so busy um, with the work of an interest in fishing and boating and the outdoors that um, you know, the Mid-Atlantic organization is kind of moving back out independently. So I'm transitioning from uh, managing the Land Conservancy uh, back over to an organization I formed, you know, 12 years ago. And, um, you know, we're going to be expanding. Actually, we have a new announcement coming out soon. with kind of some new branding. But um, yeah, so I uh, formed the Mid-Atlantic Youth Anglers in 2008. Um, you know, I would ha have been a uh, lifelong angler and the angler, the technical term for fishing um, and, uh, and also um, hunting in terms of my activities. So I formed this uh, organization, uh, which initially was, you know, what I was calling kind of my, my give back to the community and, you know, having been introduced to these outdoor activities and wanting to introduce more, you know, urban students um, in particular to um, these wonderful outdoor resources that we have um, in this region. I think as, you know, most of you know, and I'll talk to about some of this in, in some of my comments, but, you know, I've been a competitive bass angler on the amateur circuit um, for about 15 years. Um, I've not been doing that for several years, being so busy. So I was really immersed in, um, you know, elements of fishing that, um, you know, many don't get the opportunity to do, but, you know, wanted to share that kind of information. And just the, the level of study, the level of study of water and, you know, weather and everything else that impacts fishing. So I'll talk about that in some of the questions, but you know, really happy to be a part of this discussion about sharing the, the Delaware. Um, I am, am not one of those that, you know, feels that it should only be for, you know, one, two or what have you, or just, you know, keeping people away other than just the safety of the water and not 
and that not necessarily meaning not sharing it, but just, um, you know, being more cognizant of all of the, you know, demands and factors. So, you know, I'm happy to be here um, and you'll hear from me about just, you know, how, how much more popular the Delaware has become during this COVID uh, period. So I appreciate the invitation to be here as part of this panel. And Charlie, again, from Patriot Harbor Lines. No. <laughs> Probably might have to do sign language. I don't know what's going on. Oh, there you go. We can hear you now. Yeah, so I guess there's a delay. So I'm Charlie McCammon from Patriot Harbor Lines. I'm one of the owners and sometimes captain aboard our two vessels that operate out of the Seaport Museum. And we do passenger vessel cruises, um, narrated tours, and we also do charters um, from the Seaport Museum. We do tours uh, from the Seaport Museum to Schuylkill Banks. We operate on Schuylkill Banks and we also operate out of Bartram's Garden. So we do share a lot of facilities with a lot of other um, boating entities. So we have a unique perspective because we do have to do a lot of coordination when it comes to how we, op how we operate uh, at all of our different sites. Uh, we started Patriot Harbor Lines primarily as a hobby um, and really it was about seven years ago, we, the three owners, do a lot of sailing on the Delaware, a lot of boating on the Delaware, and we just wanted to get other people out on the water, and we thought that a small passenger vessel would be able to accommodate some people and give some people some unique uh, views and a unique perspective of how great the Delaware is. Fantastic. Next up, we have Jonathan Kemmerly, uh, a pilot for the Pilot Association for Bay and River Delaware. Hi, I had uh, some uh, technical difficulties there. So thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Is this the introduction part? Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been a pilot since uh, 1998. I um, went to Kings Point right across the sound from where Charlie went to school uh, a few years later. Um, and then I, I joined the group, did a three-year apprenticeship uh, from 1995 to 98. So I've been there pretty much my whole career. Um, I chaired the Harbor Safety Committee for three years from uh, 2013 to 2016. And then I was the president for the last three years, just up until uh, this past May. So, um, you know, I have a, obviously being out there for 20 years and doing 6,000 transits, I have a pretty good idea of the interaction. And, and I do have a, a better understanding of the, the other uh, aspects of whether it's political, whether it's recreational, all the different um, entities that, that are seeking to utilize the waterway. And, um, and and it's always been our role to kind of coexist with that. Um, it's always been challenging to sort of communicate what our safety concerns are. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we can't do our job unless we, you know, coexist with everyone else. So it's, um, I'm glad to be here just in hopes that we can, you know, maybe we can communicate some of our concerns in a form like this. And I think a lot of this stuff's just simple. It's, making people aware of you know what what commercial traffic is where it moves how difficult it is to stop a ship and um if, if we can just do that that'd be that'd be great so thanks for having me yeah and last but not least ali stefanik from independent seaport museum um, um i'm ali stefanik i'm the assistant director of waterfront and community programs at the independent seaport museum so i've actually i grew up on the water i've been paddling since i was two um, but i actually just started working on the delaware um, about a year and a half ago. And my job primarily is to introduce people who haven't had experiences on the water to those experiences on the water so that we can teach them a little bit more about the watershed um, and, and why it matters um, and, and why they should care about it. And a lot of that comes from having those direct experiences, enjoying it. So a lot of the work I do is getting folks out, um, similar to Liz, just in the marina and in the basin but then also um, another big part of my role is um, leading and planning our kayak excursions that actually go out onto the river. Um, and, and that's, I think, where I'll be talking from most today because that's where the, that communication piece and that sharing piece really can come into play. So I'm super excited to be here. Fantastic, so let's go ahead, let's dive into our first question. Um, so we'll start with Liz and then we'll kind of go around. Uh, what drew you to your work on the Delaware? Uh, did you have any experiences on the water at a young age? 
Um, so I've always had a strong connection with water, not specifically the Delaware. I grew up right outside of DC. Um, but when I moved to Philadelphia about four years ago, I thought there would be no possible way that I'd be able to um, see, let alone be on the water every day, um, which was kind of sad for me. I like always wanted to be a mermaid. <laughs> so um, Spruce Tree Harbor Park, had, it's like a great way to get people down to the water. And then Aqua Vita, um, which was started by John Amar, she's the founder, um, it was a way to actually get on the water. And I thought that was so amazing. It was, uh, it's such a great escape from being in Center City. So um, that's what drew me to the Delaware. And Jonathan, you wanna go next? I was still on mute. Oh. Yeah, I don't really have a background on the water. Um, my decision to go to Kings Point um, just grew out of, you know, I, it was a great opportunity. I thought it'd be a chance to travel around the world. I thought it'd be, uh, it would be a challenge. And, and so that, that's the direction I, I ended up going. And then obviously um, graduating from there and going to sea. And, and um, I was fortunate enough to um, obviously be from this area. I grew up in Westchester. So I, you know, I had some people I didn't know I knew. Um, and I was in the right place at the right time. The association at the time needed, uh, there was a lot of retirements, so they needed new pilots. So um, I was just, it was a, a tremendous uh, set of circumstances that sort of led me to this job. Um, but no, I don't really have any background. I mean, I, I, you know, I was on a boat in the Chesapeake one night with a, with a family friend and we were in a squall and, and, and that, that, that sort of set the tone for everything. Uh, but no, I don't really have a background in it, but um, but now, like I said, for 20 years, I've been there every day and, and seeing all the different aspects of it. So it's um, it's exciting to see the waterfront sort of expand and all these different users and and the challenges that come along with that. But um, that's sort of my that's how I ended up here. How about you, Charlie? Little bit of a delay, Charlie. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, That's perfect, thank you. Yeah, it takes a second for it to kick in. So I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, and my father was in the Navy, my grandfather was in the Navy, and we've always been on boats, and I've always been around boats. So I was always attracted to the, what I thought was the magic of getting on a boat and going on a trip somewhere. So I went to a maritime school, New York Maritime, first and foremost, you know, the best maritime school, as everyone knows. and. Um, <laughs> Lose them again? Yeah, I'm trying to see if it's anything I can. Oops. Go. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Better? yeah, I'm not sure why I'm getting muted. But so I think I left off, but I grew up in Annapolis. I've always loved the water. When I arrived to Philadelphia, I was a maritime attorney. A little bit. You're a little. It sounds a little far away. If that makes sense. I'm gonna go get a house phone and try to. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Okay. So, Ali, you kind of answered this uh, in your introductory in your introductory remarks. But how about you? Yeah. Um. So I, I did grow up on the water. Um. And actually. In high school, I took one of those um, like career predictor tests that was mandatory, and it, it told me that I should be a harbor master. And being the rebellious teen that I was, I decided right then and there that I was never going to work on the water. Um, and that, that didn't actually it didn't work out very well for me in the long run. Uh, but I actually I don't have much of a professional career in terms of of working on the water. My most of my professional career is actually in access, um, in college access specifically. But I did spend a long time, almost 10 years, opening up a lot of doors um, for folks around Philadelphia to access things that they're not normally used to, um, either being able to access or knowing how to access. And so when I got the opportunity to do that at the seaport um, and combine that with one of my lifetime, you know, joys and passions, I kind of jumped on that chance. And similar to Liz, I moved to Philly 10 years ago and I thought I'd never be able to get out on the water. So being able to do that and help other people do that has really been incredible. And Todd? 
So I um, am using my virtual background to communicate um, part of my, my message, um, you know, finding a different way than sharing the screen. So as I mentioned in my um, intro comments, I mean, I, uh, well, one, I grew up here in Philadelphia. I actually grew up on the Schuylkill Riverside, um, you know, of the city. And um, in the fishing activities that I, you know, immersed myself into many years ago, um, and then wanting to share this opportunity with, you know, students and families. You know, obviously it's hard to miss the Delaware River, but, you know, having, you know, uh, grown up in Philadelphia, you know, moved all around, I think the, the number that we quote is, you know, Philadelphia is 37 miles of, of river, you know, surrounding um, the city, you know, from the Delaware over to the Schuylkill. And um, Charlie, you've probably uh, seen me uh, from time to time, if you've ever captained any of your, um, you know, any of your boats down at Bartram's Gardens and you saw people fishing down there organized, that was, that was us down there um, doing that work. But, you know, really, you know, as I was thinking about this question again today um, and getting ready, you know, I think what really drew me to the Delaware, I mean, you know, in the background here, what you see are, these are some students from the Taconi Police Athletic League that we worked with for, for many years. This is up in the Shamity. And, you know, this is one of my, my favorite pictures relative to what I heard from you know, so many students at the Taconi Pal, which is a stone's throw from the river and people, you know, students that, that live. And you can see the picture is pretty diverse. It's nice to see me. Um, of these kids who grew up, um, you know, and live, you know, less than a half a mile from the river, but never were at the river. I mean, and this is one of those experiences, um, you know, from several years ago um, that we, uh, you know, introduced these students to. Um, and so the opportunity to introduce students to this um, is what drew me to it. You know, that initial background picture that I had, um, which I'll probably continue to go back and forth to, uh, were a number of uh, bass fishing boats. Um, and that's how I've done my fishing for many years. But these are boats uh, that were part of a, um, actually the, the largest bass tournament circuit in the country brought the, uh, their tournament to the Delaware that I helped to bring to the city and manage back in 2014. So that's, those are those boats right there. Um, at I think the last, uh, I guess, um, morning, evening, uh, back during that time. But the other thing that really drew me to the river is, you know, what I think a lot of people know, and I think for those that fish, you know, people think that there's no fish in the Delaware River. And, you know, uh, what drew me to the river is the opportunity to really elevate the story that we actually have, this increasing healthy body of water that you know provides you know the opportunity for you know whether or not you're a competitive angler or just somebody wanting to have fun. Um, it is that kind of water in addition to those big ships that we see moving through um, the water you know often. So that's what really drew me um, to the Delaware River. Great. So I think you know we kind of be remiss to not talk about the elephant in the room, which is COVID-19 um, and how we've definitely seen, at least I know from my perspective a lot of articles being written by local reporters about how people can safely enjoy the waterways uh, once places start to kind of reopen and lift restrictions. So as the pandemic presses on, recreational powerboat, kayak, and paddleboard sales have skyrocketed across the region. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to sharing the Delaware with other boaters, paddlers, and anglers? Um, so Charlie, why don't, you, why don't you go first? All right, so can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, so our biggest challenge, um, I think we have two challenges. Um, and I think the first large challenge is whether we have the infrastructure around Philadelphia to manage um, a lot of different users. So for example, you know, really the whole city of Philadelphia has now a, just a few marinas and there's so many different activities um, occurring at Penn's Landing that you have, um, you know, you have to really stay well coordinated. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's it's just a problem that uh, the city of Philadelphia and the neighboring areas have just never put the resources into the infrastructure that you need. You know, I don't think we actually have enough Marine police out on the water. I don't think the Coast Guard is out on the water enough. And I don't think there's been enough education um, about safe boating in the area. So I, I do love to see all the people out on the water and all the new boaters out on the water, but I do worry that uh, you have a lot of inexperienced boaters and um, there's limited, limited 
um, facilities and infrastructure and <clears throat> and the basics that you have in other big cities where you have a lot of voters. Um, and Jonathan, how about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd have to agree with what Charlie said there. I mean, working with the Coast Guard, you know, closely, you know, you, you have to respect the fact that their resources are thin and they have a lot of other missions. So I'm sort of splitting that down the middle. Like I, I kind of understand where they're at, but I, I couldn't agree more, like especially on busy weekends and, and, you know, they know as well as we know when, when people are out there, when they're intoxicated, like when it's the most dangerous. And if they just increased the presence, then I, I don't think that would have been a, I don't think it would be a tremendous tax on them, but at the same time, I don't have to fund that. So, um, but yeah, I agree, you know, as more people are out there, there's just more interaction. Um, we haven't really seen any issues at all, but that's not to say there wouldn't be. And, and we kind of know when it is, it's usually summertime, it's usually weekends and we're sort of on heightened alert during that time. So, um, aside from that, everything else is sort of in-house us just dealing with the with the pandemic, you know, getting boarding shifts, but fortunately the Coast Guard handles a lot of the screening. So it's, we sort of know what we're, we're getting into before we get there. So, um, so no, we haven't really noticed any significant increase, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I could agree with what I said. I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot of presence out there of anyone really policing anything, to be honest, from our point of view. So it's more of just sort of playing defense than it is, um, and then, but like I mentioned earlier, it's, that could fall on us too, because the educational piece, who's that going to come from, I guess. And if it's not a group like this or us or, or someone else, and it's not coming from the Coast Guard. So it has to fall on somebody. So I think there's just not enough, not enough accidents or high profile things. I think there's duck boat incidents, which bring a lot of, a lot of attention, but after that, it sort of fades into the background of the news cycle. So. And Allie, yeah. what are your thoughts on it? as someone who takes kayakers out onto the water, like you mentioned in the excursions at the seaport. Yeah, I mean, I think Charlie put it perfectly um, in saying that our biggest challenge is really just a lack of resources for everybody. I think that it's really challenging to have to share really tight spaces on the river, especially with the closure of some marinas. Um, meaning now, you know, at Penn's Landing, we are, we're kayaking, we've got the swan boats going, Patriot Harbor Lines is rolling, Spirit's right there. Um, you know, Aquavita's paddle boarding, we're like all doing this in this tiny space, which is incredible. Um, and it's been working. But then you also have new boaters who are recreational boaters who are coming either from marinas that have closed or who are, you know, we've seen a lot of like transient boaters. Um, I, I don't have the data on it, but it feels like sort of anecdotally m more than what we've seen in the past, um, who aren't as familiar with some of the activities that are happening in the marina, who then, um, because they're forced into this tiny space, because that's what's left, have to like quickly adapt. And I think when we have a plan and we all can communicate and we all understand what's happening, then, you know, it works really, it, it works really well as well as it can. But when we introduce, um, you know, new elements or, or new folks who don't necessarily know what to expect or who are you know, maybe not new to the water, but but new to the tightness of the space, then it can be a little chaotic and it can be a little nerve wracking um, if they're not willing to quickly adapt and to communicate with us. Um, because I think something that, you know, we've been trying to do and what we've been trying to do better is, is be open to communication and to like constantly be on VHF so that we can communicate. But that expectation, you know, professional boaters, um, are, are able to be contacted and are pretty receptive, but it's it's the recreational boaters who don't necessarily carry radios or don't know how to properly use it because they don't have that education piece that I think make it a little bit trickier. And I think it's a really great question, right? Like whose responsibility then is it to start educating some of these recreational boaters, especially as they come out onto the water for the first time? And Liz? Um, yeah, so we actually just stay in the marina, kind of like the duck boats, the paddle boards can't really handle the Delaware. Um, so when there are things like the kayak tours, um, we didn't really have any interference with the duck boats this summer. Um, but like the kayak tours, that's not really a huge deal for us, but it is a little nerve wracking when new recreational boaters come into the marina. And, you know, we have a lot of people that are trying out paddle boarding for the first time ever. And 
they are not, you know, quick with the paddle board. It's hard to maneuver, especially when you're just learning. So um, it can definitely get a little scary, a little dicey if there's a new boater that doesn't actually have a spot there who doesn't. I, sometimes I'm a little bit confused why they're coming in in the first place because they come in and turn right around. Um, but yeah, so I have noticed that with the new boats. And I think I did hear that there were a few marinas that had shut down. So with the recreational boats, um, it seemed a lot more present this summer than last. But when it comes to like the, the swan boats or the kayaks and stuff, like we don't, we don't really like interact with them that much. Mm -hmm. And we also, this summer, um, we had like a few off times for we would like do classes either really early in the morning or like mid work day so it worked out nicely that we wouldn't be crammed with other boats and todd when you think about um the ability to like or the challenges really to be able to kind of share it safely yeah, I, mean, I think um i think all of you hit on um the words that i wrote down just you know as we started this which is rules of the water um you know as i've been out you know, the last probably six weeks, you know, every week on a, a partnership initiative we have with the Riverfront North um, organization and facilitating, um, you know, a fishing outing for the public. And we've been at the Frankfurt, we've been back rotating between the Frankfurt Arsenal and the um, Pleasant Hill hatcheries at the uh, Linden Avenue area. And, you know, I've seen, I think, as, as, as many of us have seen, you know, the number of jet skis and others that are you know, just constantly, you know, just ripping and running, you know, back and forth. But it, it also has me thinking about, to a point, John, you uh, just made um, that I've seen for several years, which is, you know, we don't have a lot of policing. And Charlie, you started this out in your comment. Um, we don't have a lot of policing. I mean, a lot of money is spent, you know, bringing people to the water, but we don't have that investment, you know, on the water. I mean, I think you know, I commend, um, you know, this group for pulling together to talk about this because I do think we're right at the doorstep of, you know, forming a collaborative to, I think, to really get at this. I mean, we've been a really active partner and the Seaport Museum has with the Delaware River the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. So, you know, we do have, you know, I think some organized elements that can help elevate this. You know, I kind of look at what's happening on the water similar to a park. I mean, while you know, in the sense of a water park, we're not an amusement park, but that's really what we have here. We have multiple uses. And so without having the proper policing, you know, on the water, okay, for those that are using the water combined with education, when people, you know, put their recreational, um, you know, resources on the water, whether or not it's a jet ski or whether or not it's a fishing boat or recreational boat, you know, we're now out there on the water with you know, John and Charlie with, with you know, side by side or in and around the things that you all are doing. You know, there's nobody educated, you know, um, anybody about that. So, you know, I think that that's really what we need. We need, you know, education, communication, and something that can help coordinate it. Um, and it's something I've seen, I mean, this summer since I've been over at the Frankfurt Arsenal, um, you know, more than I have actually that tournament, those boats that you see in the water there, you know, they launched uh, the tournament out of the Frankfurt Arsenal Park. And I don't know, any of you that have been to the Franklin Arsenal, but you know it's arguably one of the, the best recreational boating locations in this region of the country. That the city closed this summer because of the you know heavy use uh, by COVID, but it's out of the way to the point where people actually have you know convened to the point of causing a problem that the city had to close it. Um, and you know while you know, I think all of us can blame those that are not acting the right way you know, there's no stationary element of any element of the city there. So it's basically a free for all. So um, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction with this discussion here in terms of sharing the water and what's needed to help manage on the water. And, um, so, oh, sorry, go ahead, Charlie. I was actually wondering about the, uh, the ramp being closed because the last time I was up the river, I was like, why is the ramp closed this time of the season? And I guess that's what the reason was, because I, I was curious as why the uh, ramp was closed. But it makes sense that if you can't control the people that are using the ramp and if it gets out of hand, they're going to have to close things down. But I don't know if that's the best answer. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's something, I think, um, from a collaborative element. And, you know, one of the things that I, I just want to plant a seed in terms of where we go from, from here. I mean, we're now doubling down. Uh, with our mid-Atlantic activities and kind of reinvesting, you know, uh, with the resource of the Delaware, 
And, you know, fortunately, we, again, with everybody here and some other um, organizations we've talked to is, you know, we have to put the message in front of, you know, the, our policymakers, our elected officials, and, you know, garner the resources that are needed because, you know, I mean, the Coast Guard and the PA Fish and Boat Commission, I mean, you know, has very limited staff down here. So, um, you know, and again, Frankfurt Arsenal, it's out of the way. So any activity that's happening there, if you're not there, you know, on, in, at that location, you can't see it. Um, and so it got to the point where, you know, there were late at night parties, you know, happening till two, three o'clock in the morning. So the city just decided to close it to the public, um, you know, versus to try to do something more, which, you know, obviously they couldn't given the you know, financial constraints that they're all under. But again, I think it's an opportunity going forward, you know, for all of us to kind of pull together to support those kinds of, um, you know, access areas. So kind of uh, on the flip side of this question would be, uh, what do you enjoy about sharing the Delaware with others? Or how do you enjoy sharing the Delaware with others? Uh, so Liz? So um, my favorite thing is taking a new bee out on the water. Somebody who has never paddle boarded before is definitely my favorite way to share the Delaware with people. Um, it's just really fun to see people like have that interaction with the water and everybody's super nervous at first, but then once they start going with the flow a little bit more and like on the board and and uh, calming down a little bit and getting used to being on the water then it's just you see them light up and um it's just it's really it's really nice to see that connection just like spark right there when they come on the water for the first time um so yeah so that's definitely my favorite thing to do on the delaware uh, and charlie yeah i think my favorite thing is bringing someone <clears throat> someone new on the onto the river whether it's the young kids, I, I mean, we do a lot of the camp kids uh, at the Seaport Museum, and they always have a great time. But even older Pennsylvanians, older Philadelphians who've lived in the city 30, 40, 50 years, they get out for their first cruise, and they're like, oh, I had no idea that the Delaware River was here. I had no idea that the Schuylkill River was here. It's so beautiful out here on the water. I wish I had known. And um, they get a whole different perspective of where they live. They, they understand that uh, Philadelphia is connected by water to the rest of the world and that um, it's very peaceful. And, and when people get out on our, our, our cruises, uh, most of them put down their phones for the first time in a long time and they really relax. And, you know, if, if I'm not on the cruise, I'm meeting the crews um, at the end of the cruise, people are just relaxed and have a whole better attitude. So, you know, I love getting people out. I think it it relaxes people. It's a uh, it's a it's a different pers uh, experience from the hustle and bustle of uh, Philadelphia. For sure. And Jonathan. Yeah, I mean the same type of thing. Um, in in our role, it's it's usually some industry folks or um, elected officials. So we're always making an effort to to get either state or even federal officials out on vessels just to, there's no better way to sort of sensitize them to what goes on and, and the importance. Of course, that comes from more of a commercial side, you know, for viability and for dredging and for channels, but, but yeah, there's, there's nothing better than someone sort of getting it um, very quickly by climbing up the side of the ship and then immediately understanding what, not only what our job is, but what the importance is to the regional economy and, and the very fact that there's a river there and, and there's a, a huge importance that goes with that. So yeah, that's, that's usually the best. I mean, we've also, I've also taken friends, family members. So yeah, there's, there's nothing like bringing people out there and just, you know, their realization of, of what, what's going on out there, you know, in its entirety. So yeah, bringing up other folks out there. And Todd. So you know, I have uh, kind of two categories of things. One uh, to Jonathan and Charlie, what I love about sharing Delaware is when um, uh, your uh, boats and ships are coming down the channel. And, you know, a lot of people think that when they see these, you know, boats or ships and they're moving and they're creating, you know, weights or they're moving, you know, the water, you know, people say, well, damn, you know, they're upsetting us, our ability to catch fish. Actually, we catch, we catch more fish after those boats, okay, are coming through the water because fish get really active, if you all didn't know this, okay, um, as, the, as those wakes and others are coming to the, shore, uh, to the uh, banks of the water. So I love seeing you all there as long as um, I'm not too close to the ships because I have had 
a number of ships sneak up on me, okay, while I'm fishing because they're extremely quiet. So one, I like sharing it because it does, you know, create some opportunities to catch more fish. The other element is, you know, to what I think everybody talked about here is getting new people on the water. I mean, the experience I think is all of us have seen when you are on that river and looking back at land, it is a completely different perspective of what you see on both sides. I mean, the, the, the beauty of the city, you know, when you're there, you know, you know, within the center city area, you know, I mean, just, it, it's an incredible view to see um, the city and on both sides. And then, you know, a little further up when we're, you know, out of the downtown area, you know, it's just as beautiful and it's different. And so um, I love that element of sharing the water. And then also what, you know, I do as much as, as, as I can, which is ed educating people that this water is actually healthier, okay, than, you know, people imagine. I'm const we're constantly dealing with the element of, well, the water's dirty, the water's dirty. We say, no, the water's actually murkier stained. And there's a reason why, you know, with the two tidal, two times a day that our tide swings, you know, five to eight feet, you know, is one of the reasons and we have a lot more nutrients in the water. So the opportunity to educate people that this body of water, you know, it didn't just become this way as we know. I mean, it's been a coordinated effort for many, many years to increase the health of the water. So the opportunity to share that um, with adults and students is, is one of my favorite things about uh, the river. Great, and Allie? Well, I'm, I totally agree. I think the, the easiest, most joyful part of introducing folks to the river is, um, you know, that little kid or even that grandma who is really nervous and then gets out there and realizes this is the best thing they've ever done and can't wait to do it again. Um, but also to Todd's point, you know, it's that educational piece um, and introducing folks to the fact that the Delaware River in particular, you know, our portion of it isn't just the stretch you see from the Ben Franklin to the Walt Whitman, but actually it's, it's huge, you know, and that it runs all the way up to um, New York and, and that it runs all the way down to the bay and that all of that water is connected um, and, and that folks are using every portion of it, I think is easy to forget when you're right, you know, in the heart of the city and looking out at just the tiny little portion of the Delaware that's ours. Um, maybe easier for Jonathan to, to keep in, in mind. Um, but if, for the, the folks who I work with normally, you know, the little piece of the Delaware that you can see from Spruce Street Harbor Park is the piece that they look at most often. So showing them the, the piece of it that's behind Petty's Island or the piece of it that wraps around the airport and then keeps going for what looks like forever is really exciting. Great. So we're going to get to the, we're going to start the Q&A session in just a little bit. So if you have any questions, we already have a couple in the Q&A chat box, uh, but please feel free to add in any that you might have as well. Um, but I kind of want to, before we do that, I do want to ask our panelists, what advice would you offer someone who wanted to explore our portion of the lower title Delaware for the first time? So what do you think they would need to kind of go out? Um, so Ali, we'll start with you. I would definitely make sure that you do some research. Um, I think that's key. You know, anytime that you're exploring, whether you have a ton of boating experience or, or no on water experience, you really need to know what you're getting into. I think that there's a lot of really unique hazards to our portion of the river um, that aren't really obvious to the eye. You know, sharing the river with, with other boaters and with anglers is just one of those many, many hazards to our portion of the river. Um, and until you really understand those hazards, you don't know what kind of trouble you could get yourself into. Um, and that's, you know, excluding the element of, of sharing the river with, you know, all of the folks here and, and a bunch of more people as well. Um, so definitely, definitely do some research. Um, take a class if, if you don't know how to use whatever boat you're planning to board or however you're trying to get onto the river. There's lots of um, low cost or, or free or introductory style classes out there um, that, you know, I definitely recommend taking advantage of. And Todd, your advice? You know, I think what, what Charlie offers and what Patriot offers, I think is one of the best ways to, you know, easily get on, on the water, whether or not it's out of Barton Gardens or there, you know, at Penn's Landing, you know, because I mean, that gives, I think, everybody a really full understanding of, you know, what they can see, you know, through the, at, with the breadth of the water. I mean, as Ali, you mentioned, the opportunity to go from, you know, Penn's Landing all the way around to the Schuylkill side and then, you know, even further up. And then also taking advantage of what the Seaport Museum 
in particular and other organizations offer um, that can get people on the water. Um, I mean, I'm always nervous when I see kayakers that, you know, may venture out into the uh, main stem, uh, you know, of the water, because obviously there are a lot of dangers, you know, they are not necessarily, you know, just the vessels that are there, but, you know, when we have our storms and others, which is one of the, my favorite things about educating people of uh, what happens when we have these storms, I mean, the number of logs and others that are in the water when you get there, because it is a big body of water, and until you're on it, you actually don't have a sense of the order of magnitude, you know, of this water, so, we have some great resources to, you know, for people to um, to get out there, and you know, we're hopefully looking for more recreational opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of fishing clubs use uh, the Delaware River, and so you know, they're out and around. They don't publicize as, as much as they probably um, should, but you know, any opportunity to get on any part of the water is what we recommend to people. Fantastic, and Liz. Um, so I always tell people who want to get out on the Delaware that to definitely follow the tides, um, mm -hmm. high tide or bust <laughs> to get out on the water, especially on the paddle boards if you're likely to fall in. Um, and then my other piece of advice to people always go out on the water is don't bring anything that you don't want to get wet. <laughs> but like, that's just for if you fall in and your sunglasses go to the bottom. But um, yeah, the tides are so important mm -hmm. for the water quality, for your safety, for, I mean, the tide in the marina can get down to like less than a foot. So it's not really fun boating if you can't move anywhere because you're stuck on the bottom. Um, and also know what you're doing. Because like I said, it, with the paddle boards, if you're new to it, or to kayaking or anything, there are a lot of inexperienced boaters, even just coming into the marina, which feels very safe and guarded, um, but a paddleboard versus a big boat, it's not gonna end well. So know what you're doing when you get out there. Perfect, and Charlie, your advice? Yeah, so just to follow with all that great advice, I, I always caution people about how actual dangerous uh, the Delaware is. It looks like a very peaceful river, but I've been on many, many rivers, and it's probably one of the most dangerous rivers around. So I like to caution people about that. Um, I like to remind people that you know you should wear a life jacket if you're on a paddleboard out there um, on the Delaware, if you're in a kayak, or if you're on a jet ski. Uh, even myself, um, you know, this summer, even on a Wednesday night sailboat race or or. I'll be I'll wear a life jacket and have my daughters wear a life jacket, even though it's a, because all it takes is, is a one little slip and you're in the river and it's very dangerous. Um, and I think also we just have to highlight that there's education available. You know, um, there are licensing requirements for everybody that's uh, out on a boat, a motorized boat, you know, and there's, uh, there's resources that people can take to do education. Uh, I do think that, you know, as a, as a society, we might want to, be more diligent about requiring education. You know, if somebody takes a safe boating course once in their life online for 30 minutes. Have they really been educated about, you know, how how things should be on the river? You know, the pilots and any professional mariner has to be continuously um, educated and renew their licenses and re renew their qualifications. So, you know, that's something that we might want to talk to politicians about or, you know, I I'm not uh, uh, keen on a lot of regulation in boating, but I do think people should have basic boating skills, a basic boating course to understand what the dangers are and what the safety precautions are, what should, what they should do in an emergency. So that's what I that's what I think. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, I think people should get out on the river and enjoy the river. I think it's a it's a beautiful river, and and I I'm often sad. I mean, I guess I go out to fishing sometimes. I have I have a lot of different boats. I have a sailboat. I'm at, whenever I'm out on the river all by myself. I enjoy it, but then it makes me a little sad that I'm like, okay, I'm the only one on this portion of the river enjoying it. It's great, but it's a little sad that nobody else is out here too. And Jonathan? Uh, yeah, wear a, wear, a, wear a life jacket. Wear a life jacket, wear a life jacket, wear a life jacket. <laughs> I mean, even professional mariners, some of them don't for a myriad of reasons. And it's, we have people go in the water more often than they should and there's more close calls than there should be and yeah life jacket wear a life jacket wear a life jacket and if the water's cold don't go near it i i had a third mate on my first ship 
point over the side and say, you just might as well, that might as well be the, the edge of a skyscraper. Because if you go in, we're not turning this thing around in time to get you. And you're going to be hypothermic before we even turn this, before the engine room even knows you're going to be dead. So water's cold. And if you hit your head going over the side to Charlie's point, you can be on a sunfish. If you hit your head on the mast before you go over, if you're unconscious, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be treading water. So, yeah. And a lot of people down the river, up river, where I live up here in Bucks County, you know, it just kind of goes unnoticed. It just, but knowing the captain of the port over the past 10 years, the way that I have the different captains of the port, they'll every now and again tell me, you know, on the side about how dangerous it is. So yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Wear a life jacket. And I mean, before, I don't want to go too far in this because I'm going to forget, but like, you know, people could say, well, how do I know what's moving around out there? Even if I wanted to pay attention, you know, marine traffic, it's an app, it's a free app. You can download it and you can see everything that's moving around. You can do it for fun. I do it with airliners just to pass the time sometimes. So yeah, you know, anybody can see what's moving around commercially, how fast it's going. And yeah. And when in doubt, wear a life jacket. So we're going to go to the Q&A section. Um, so this is our first question. What can be done to help the city and DRWC see the importance of the waterfront to boaters in addition to folks coming to spend time in parks? Closing PMC and allowing it to become condos was a big loss for the city from a recreational boating perspective. I want to maybe jump at, at that. I mean, having uh, lived down there, um, actually, before I moved out here to Chester County, I, I moved from uh, Waterfront Square right by the um, right by the Ben Franklin Bridge and our headquarters of Mid Atlantic organization was down there. And, you know, I watched for, for, for many years the development projects, um, you know, come and go. But, you know, I think probably the best thing that, um, you know, individuals and then also getting others to do is to, to be a voice to our elected officials. Um, both those, I mean, our city council members that represent that um, area down there, Councilman Mark Swilla, who's been, you know, um, a longtime advocate of that area, and, and others, because, you know, developers and others that have interests, I mean, that's the direction that they're going, you know, and so it's generally the squeaky wheel kind of gets the grease, and so I think it's an imperative for those that have an interest in seeing the on-water elements, um, you know, uh, get the level of support is to be a voice to our elected officials, and again, both city and state, um, because then they'll start to listen. Um, you know, they you know have quite a bit of influence um, on what happens there. I mean, DRWC has done a tremendous job in, in, in managing the, the interest that exists to create that, you know, complex that is continuing to grow. Um, so that's my recommendation there uh, for that, that question. Yeah, I, I would add that I, I reiterate that it's, it's important to talk to the politicians but it's also important to talk to the businesses. So for example, uh, Brandywine, who has um, been developing the Schuylkill River, um, you know, we've gotten them out on cruises and, and they've seen you know, what that added element of having boaters out on the river looks like. Um, but, it, but it is very difficult in Philadelphia. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I think it's a, a little bit of the accountability. I think a lot of developers will say that they're going to put a marina in and then the politicians never uh, hold them to that. You know, whenever you see renderings of any new developments on the river, it always includes boats and marinas, but is there the infrastructure there to, to make that picture come true? Probably not. And, and I don't blame DRWC. I think they have a lot of different missions. Um, uh, you know, I just think that uh, I think there's a growing group of people on social media that are uh, interested in boating in the Delaware River. And, you know, we're just going to have to all pull together and just do our own part to communicate with uh, people that have influence and and try to get uh, try to get the, the resources we need to make uh, Philadelphia a better boating destination. Just piggybacking real quick on that, Charlie. I mean, I think it, it's almost to the point where, you know, it needs to be a part of the requirement for when, you know, permits and zoning and others, you know, are pursued by developers. Because if there's not something that requires them to, to do it, I mean, we all know the benefit that comes with it. 
um, and they're dollars that can follow, you know, that element. So it, it's very easy to present these renderings um, of what is projected, but if it's not something that, um, you know, was kind of, you know, held accountable and made a part of what the developer is going to do. I mean, I'm not a big fan of regulation where it's not needed, but, you know, if we're all looking at trying to increase access, you know, we need to make sure that those that are getting access, you know, provide some of those components. Yeah, there, and there's some money out there that um, can be used for building marinas and infrastructure. You know, we, we everyone that buys gasoline for a, mo a boat um, puts money, you know, there's money that goes into a government funds. So it's, you know, it, it's it's a hard, you know, losing the, the Philadelphia Marine Center, I think it's very hard to a lot of people. And actually, when you think about it, Philadelphia Marina, the marina was actually the first part of the Delaware River actually being revitalized. And to spend 25 years where that was the cornerstone of what the, got everything started to then get rid of it is, is a hard, uh, hard uh, thing to swallow. So our next question is, as a captain of passenger vessel, safety boat instructor, maritime teacher, and Coast Guard auxiliary vessel examinator, I agree on the importance of safety on the water. My question is, what do you consider to be your responsibility for stewardship of the river and bay, and how do you communicate that to your stakeholders? I, I can jump at that a couple of ways, but go ahead, Al, you're going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I think about stewardship a lot um, whenever I'm bringing folks out on the water. And I think about it really in two, two main ways. Um, and when I think about my stakeholders, I think of them primarily moment and then how they go on to lead their lives as citizens of Philadelphia or their surrounding area. Um, and so I think about really how I can teach them very quickly um, about the watershed and, and how the water in their house is connected to the water that we're, you know, exploring. And I think about empowering them in terms of their safety, um, especially with my kayakers who are going out on the river with me for the first time to maybe on their own reach the conclusion that they're not quite ready to do this by themselves yet. I think like those are the two most important things that I can do that I try to do with everybody that I take out on the river. Um, is to realize how dangerous it is and to realize how connected to it we all already are. Well, I'm going to throw this now, I just kind of piggybacking on some of the work that you do. Um, a part of the training that we do, not necessarily just with the uh, Delaware, but um, how we're communicating to our stakeholders, which are students and families, is, is really deepening the understanding of watershed protection and that the things that are happening in our communities for you know for the benefit of what we would like to do in enjoying the river recreationally whether or not that's you know fishing or jet skiing that you know what's happening you know two miles away in our neighborhoods you know whether or not it's you know dumping you know oil down the storm drain or you know dogs you know um you know desecrating on on concrete that you know that ultimately is going to see its way down to the delaware river so you know, that communication to stakeholders is, you know, everything that's happening in our city effectively is going to end up, okay, in the Delaware and Schuylkill River if we're not, you know, conscious of that. So that to me is one of the main responsibilities as a stakeholder. And I, I think I know the, the person who asked that question who put um, my, my Coast Guard safety sticker on my, on our boat that was in the Philadelphia Marine Center. I think uh, Dave Bell who answered that and I believe also it was a an instructor at the Maritime Academy Charter School, which was our first school that our Mid-Atlantic organization worked with, you know, probably a decade ago. So I'm glad to see that question. Great. So our next question, um, how do you think the future development of Penn's Landing will impact you, the work you do, or the people you serve? And kind of as a follow-up to that, what do you think organizations and businesses could do to increase the number of river uses? To kind of build off a, a point that Charlie made earlier in the discussion. Yeah, I, you know, we're we're trying to sort of think in the future of, of how the Penn's Landing development will affect us. 
I, you know, over the last seven years, there's been more and more people using uh, Spruce Street Harbor Park, more and more people at Penn's Landing. Um, and it, it, it's a, you know, I, I hate to see th something change that's been really working for seven years, but I understand why they want to change. Um, so I'm hopeful that it's going to just make everything better. And I think the more people that come down there and question, oh, how come, why can't I get on a boat? Why can't I keep a boat on the Delaware? I, you know, why do we have all of this real estate that's on the river, but we don't actually get out on the river? Uh, you know, I think it's going to help, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always a difficult proposition because you're, you know, you're worried about, okay, where are our passengers going to park? You know, are they going to be able to get here during the construction and that sort of thing? Uh, but the nice thing about a boat is you can always change where the boat operates. So unfortunately for the Seaport Museum, they're at you know, the Seaport Museum for now, unless they get the Olympia underway, is, is a stationary place. But we could always run cruises from anywhere. We could go, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited what's, about what's, going to happen at um, Petty's Island. We're actually taking a bunch of politicians uh, in two weeks from Wiggins up around the back end of Petty's Island to sort of give them, you know, these are senators, politicians that on the Camden side, it seems that they get a lot of this stuff that what we see, what will happen at Petty's Island will be completely different from what happens in Philadelphia. Um, so that there's opportunities there for boaters and for people to get out on the water and to, for there to be programming there. Um, I don't like to say, you know, I think Philadelphia will always be our home, but um, it's, it's, it's not easy being in Philadelphia either. I just want to um, add in there, Charlie, on top of that, that, you know, we, do, we are fortunate to have um, a number of organizations that are, that are committed to the river and, and growing. Um, you know, Bartram's Gardens that we've been working with for, for several years has a pretty expansive plan to expand access to the, to the river. I mean, right now, what they're offering with their, you know, almost effectively free boating um, there on the weekends. I mean, that's, you know, been somewhat, I think, suspended with COVID. So, you know, getting involved in these organizations that, you know, are already invested, that are expanding, I think is the, is the best opportunity for people to get involved. Um, you know, the Riverfront North Partnership, which working i think on eight different parks um you know i mean they're starting right above where uh, drwc um ends we're at penn treaty all the way up i mean you know they're a growing organization and are opening up you know new opportunities so you know i you know suggest and recommend to everybody who's listening here and those that we touch is to you know you know let's get involved in the organizations you know that um, are invested here i mean you know being able to join this kind of you know collaborative here I mean, um, you all brought, have brought together. First time I've actually had this experience with, you know, talking with those that have a commercial interest to those that have a recreational. So, um, and again, that starts to open up opportunities uh, like the Frankfurt Arsenal. I mean, I just think it's such a, um, a resource that is not being, being utilized. Um, because I know the concern that we have in, on the boating side, on the fishing side, you know, most of the fishing tournaments that, you know, take place, you know, go elsewhere to put their boats in the water because, you know, one of the most important times of putting your boat in the water is what happens to what you leave off the water. And so, you know, a lot of recreational boaters have not, you know, uh, taken advantage because uh, we don't have a lot here in Philadelphia, but we do have the resource of the arsenal, but, you know, more support is needed there. Great, so we have time for just two more questions. Um, our next question is, I recently moved to New Jersey from Maryland. With the river being in an urban industrial and port area, does the Delaware River carry the same stigma of poor health as Baltimore's Inner Harbor? Yes, <laughs> I think it definitely does. I know whenever I'm telling people to like, come try and get on a paddleboard or come even do the kayaking. I know I have a lot of friends that um, love to kayak as well. Everybody's like, in the Delaware, ew, no way. And I have to tell them it's fine, especially at high tide. Um, you know, like the water quality has gone up tremendously. And I think that's something for a lot, of, it's hard for people to get past. I, I feel like a lot of people just don't believe it. They just kind of write it off. Um, and it doesn't help that the water, you know, is a little murky, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's poisonous, <laughs> it, it, the water quality has gone up a lot. So, but that is definitely still a stigma that 
you know, we kind of have to fight all summer long. But yeah. I want to just add, uh, Liz, to that. And again, I think this gets to one of the early points about the communication and, and education. Um, you know, we, I mean, one of the factors that we had with Bartram Gardens, some of the, you know, fishing and boating is, you know, uh, getting on the water. And again, it doesn't make a difference where anybody is, whether it's, you know, up in the suburbs or, you know, um, in the city is just understanding what happens to the body of water. I mean, you know, after it rains, it's not a time to be on the water. You know, I mean, it's a, Total body of water to get the education that you know what's in Philadelphia and the Delaware is going to end up in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you know, again, we to Charlie's point, it's one of the most dangerous bodies of water, you know, around if you don't pay attention to what's here. So, I think it's just a matter of educating people on what happens. I, and I forgot the, the the gallons that are that flow on a, you know, I think on a every five minute basis. But I mean, you know, the water is filtering itself, you know, by nature of it being a tidal body of water and so as we start to get that information out about, you know, the times to go, things that actually are happening to the water, um, I think, you know, people will understand that, um, you know, there are times to go and there are times not to go. And it's not always going to be that way. Yeah, I, and I would, I'd agree that there's a stigma that's sort of a traditional stigma uh, with regard to pollution. And, you know, I, I would avoid swimming in the, in the Delaware um, after rain, but, most of the time, the Delaware is very, very clean. I mean, the, the amount of fish in the river, people would be amazed if they were into fishing. I, I've been fishing for the last three weeks up and down the Delaware and in the Schuylkill, and you can't help but catch so many fish. And the amount of birds, I mean, I, there's a pair of uh, bald eagles that have been hanging out in cams, and sometimes they come down. But the, the amount of um, large, um, you know, eagles, the uh, there's there's so much wildlife on on the river um that's that would not be around if it wasn't a very clean river so it's a clean beautiful river there are times after it rains that it's not so beautiful but after a day it's looking good again and the last question for the evening uh what do you think this panel's next steps will be or next steps in general after after the panel to ensure a safe uh, sharing in the Delaware. Come out and go fishing. Um, one of these Thursdays, uh, either at the Frankfurt Arsenal Park, um, and I think all this information is being promoted through the Front North Facebook page and website. So, you know, come out and go fishing and experience. You know what Charlie said. I mean, there the, the numbers of species of fish in the Delaware are would blow people's minds. I mean, it's um, healthier than it's ever been. Yeah, I would. I tell people just to. There's there's a lot of uh, availability to to get on on the water. So, for example, you can the Schuylkill Banks. There's do kayaks. Bartram Gardens does kayaking. The Seaport Museum does kayaking. You could do Aqua Vita. Um, there's sailing programs um, in Philadelphia. There's sailing programs south of Philadelphia. Uh, so there's there's a lot of opportunities. Um, they're probably, you know, it, it's a it's a weird it's not a weird community, but it's not all cohesive community where we always do everything together. But there are times throughout the year, and you know, traditionally um, during um, the Delaware River Fest or which used to be called Coast Days, we do all get together. The Coast Guard gets together. All the you know, all the different stakeholders get together to have an event. So, you know, I would hopefully next year, this time of year, we're able to have our Coast Day event and maybe, you know, between now and then, you know, this group can get together and uh, collaborate. Um, I really think that that's what I'd like to see happen next. Um, you know, I really see this conversation that we had today. Well, one, I'm, I'm really grateful that we've, we, we've had it, but I hope that this is the start of this conversation, you know, and not the end. I think it's really important, not just for us here on the panel, but for all of us who are interested in, in who are actively exploring the Delaware to come together and to talk about some of the challenges that we have and talk about ways that we can, you know, more safely share the Delaware. Like, I'd love to have a follow-up conversation about some of the specific ways that we can communicate better or can, um, you, you know, 
coordinate our timing a little bit better or, or things like that. Um, and I think that it would be fairly easy to organize either another conversation or, um, you know, may, maybe even some kind of group or organization that takes more of a hard look at, at how we share the Delaware. Well, I wanted to thank you all again for joining us tonight, all of our panelists, Ali, Charlie, Todd, Jonathan, Liz. I think this was a really great discussion, getting a lot of great feedback about saying how insightful it is and, and having a lot of people hearing how excited and passionate we are about the topic. So I want to thank you. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, as we send the marketing materials, this is part of the 2020 virtual Delaware River Festival. Um, as Charlie said, normally we are able to have a really big party outside of the seaport and along the basin and over in Camden. This year, obviously not allowed to, so we're moving it all virtually. So there, the a festival does still run through October 4th. So you should check out their website. They have tons of great programmings all throughout the day. Their website's DelawareRiverFest.org. Uh, or if you go to our calendar on the Seaports website, we have a link there too. So thank you all again so much for joining and we hope to see you on the waterfront really soon. Take care, right. everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Go fishing. <laughs> <laughs>